Hello and welcome to the Home Assistant Podcast. My name is Phil Hawthorne. Joining me as usual, I have Mr. Rohan Karamandi. How's it going? Good. And joining us today, another fellow Aussie. I always love it when there's a fellow Aussie helping me out here. It's uh, Alan. Good morning. Oh, sorry. It's good evening. Hey, guys. How's it going? Good, good. This episode is sponsored by Home Assistant Cloud by Nabucasa. Easily access your local Home Assistant instance remotely for a small monthly fee that supports the Home Assistant and ESP home projects. Configuration is done by the user interface, so there's no fiddling with router settings, SSL certs, or any other YAML. So, Alan, all the way from Brizzy, the sunshine state of Australia, up north. Yes, the non-lockdown at the moment state. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. Very lucky. All right. So, yeah, welcome to the, the podcast. And I guess um, let's start off with how we want to find out, you know, where have you started using Home Assistant and, and tell us a bit about your journey, that, how you got here. Yeah, sure. I probably started in a bit of a different place from most people. I used to play around with the Arduino boards for a long time and spent ages just, you know, mucking around with different sensors and, you know, interfacing them and kind of playing with temperature sensors and ultrasonics and, you know, all those all those kind of things just as a, oh, that's interesting. I'll, you know, I'll probably find a use for that one day. And so I built up a whole lot of libraries and sort of sample code for, for those sorts of things over the years. But mm-hmm. um, it's kind of hard because they obviously didn't have any sort of connectivity on them. So they were interesting as standalone devices, but not really kind of anything beyond that. And then um, then the ESP8266 came along. So I started sort of moving a lot of those things to that device. And obviously that's got the Wi-Fi connectivity. So and the Bluetooth as well. And- yeah, yeah. That started opening up you know, a whole lot of other options there. So I started off using what was called um, ThingSpeak, you know, the IoT platform and pumping data up into that and doing some cool graphs and stuff. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, that was, that was pretty interesting. And then... Uh, from there, I actually moved on to um, Blink, the IoT platform, um, B-L-Y-N-K. So, mm-hmm. um, and that's, you know, that was pretty good because that's got drag and drop and, and you can actually have switches and buttons and things that do things rather than just looking at your data. So I still actually use Blink at the moment. It's quite good for sort of standalone type devices, but it's not that easy when you've got multiple devices that you want to use together. And, you know, when you do the sort of automations and tying it in with other other devices around your house, it kind of gets a bit difficult to do things because you've obviously got to do as all as code in Blink. So yeah, so I started looking for a, a bit of a better platform to kind of integrate great a few of those platforms and yeah found home assistant and uh started started mucking around with that and thought yep this looks this looks like the right thing for me so that would have been uh, about it's about mid 2018 so i think i got on board with it when it was around about um version 0.68 so, mm-hmm. yep. you know, obviously there was a lot of stuff that was still in YAML and not so much yeah. configuration via the UI at that stage. So it's good. I got a, got a crash course in, um, in YAML as well. So <laughs> that kind of, um, that was a good, good exercise to kind of learn and, and get me set up with Home Assistant. So, yeah, and from there, I just kind of started looking for problems and thinking, oh, you know, how could I, what could I do with this or how could I integrate that or, you know, how can I get these two sort of separate devices around the house that logically would make sense if they talk to each other to, to get them working and just started building up the home assistant sort of options and configuration from there. So, yeah, that's that's where it all started. And what's that? Um, three years later, it's still still going strong. So That's awesome. So, so how do you, like, like you said, you used to use Blink and you still do a little bit. Like, how do you delineate what kind of, what you use where? Uh, for the kind of, uh, I guess, a one-off open close button type applications or where I want a good mobile graph type experience, um, I tend to use Blink for that because it does have some better graphing capabilities and it's also got um, some better sort of buttons mm-hmm. and sliders and, and things like that. And it tends to be a bit more mobile friendly as well. So still still use that for those sort of standalone type applications. Whereas, you know, when the, the things that are more the automated and, and rely on different devices around the place that are, don't integrate with Blink, because obviously it's code that you've got to write and upload to the device. So, you know, that that doesn't work with um, with a lot of those off-the-shelf products. And is it all cloud-based or does it come, is it locally? 
Yeah, it is. It's cloud by default. You can run a local Blink server, right. but, but I just went for the, mm -hmm. the cloud option just to get it up and running, um, up and running in a hurry. So what I've typically done for a lot of those sensors around the place is I have um, the Blink code running on them, which sends the data to Blink and also MQTT as well to send it to Home Assistant. So mm -hmm. it goes to both of those platforms. And is that like MQTT discovery or just? It's got its own. Uh, no, I actually do my all my MQTT manually. I don't know why I do that. I think it's just a <laughs> a legacy thing from when I started working in Home Assistant, and I've never kind of gone over to do it automatically. Right. Yeah, I just I just still do it manually for some reason. But yeah. every time I look at that, I think, yeah, I should change it to be automatic. I'll put that on the list. <laughs> That's it. That's funny. And so, is that a free API that you use, like with like up in the cloud, like that Blink? Is the you have to pay per device you're pushing up? Yeah, to them, they've they've actually just brought out a new version in the last couple of months, and they've sort of changed the whole the whole way that it interfaces, the whole model, everything. But previously, it worked on this concept of um, energy, and what you did was you bought energy in in the app that you use on your phone, and each sort of widget that you put on uh, a um, a project uses a bit of that energy. So, you know, simple buttons might use 200 energy units, but, you know, graphs might use 800 energy units or something like that. So, yeah, so it's... Um, and the good thing is it recycles. So if you delete the project and put all the widgets back, you get your energy back for them. So, but yeah, they've they've changed the business model now and they're not doing it on the energy. It's like a per device way that they're yeah. doing the, the costs for that now. So, yeah, I think they're still continuing to support the legacy model of doing that. So, as long as they do, I'll probably just keep using it for those. Interesting. Okay. So I was just looking at their website really quick. It, it does look pretty neat. Like it, it does look like it's got a really nice uh, UI to it. Yeah. Look, the buttons and the sliders and like it's got, you know, joysticks and yeah. all sorts of kind of really cool interface widgets that you can use to to interact with devices. So it's actually, you know, it is actually a little bit better than, than Home Assistant when it comes to that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. And do you use that as an interface for your devices or do you have them typically in a Lovelace dashboard that you would use instead? Oh, I've got I've got both. It just depends where I am and what I want to do. So some things that make sense and they're a bit easier and quicker yep. to do them using the Blink interface and other things I use the, the Lovelace. So typically on the mobile, I'll sort of use Blink about half the time, I guess, whereas on the on the desktop, I just use Lovelace all the time because it's obviously a better a better experience on the desktop. Yeah, gotcha. So, so what kind of cool stuff are you doing with uh, with both? I guess or either. Yeah. So, because I had that kind of library of, I guess, sensors and interfaces and everything, I I kind of went looking for problems as I said. So, of course. one of the first things that I did was um, back in the olden days when I had lots of time on my hand before before kids, I used to do a lot of home brewing. So, so I don't do the home brewing anymore, but I kept my mm -hmm. kegs um, that I used to use when I did the home brewing. Mm -hmm. So, kegs are a really great way to store your beer. So now I just go to a local microbrewery and get them to fill the kegs oh, for cool. me. But it's almost impossible well it's very difficult to tell how much is left beer is left in a keg so you can do it by weight and most people just kind of give a little bit of a rock back and forth oh yeah i reckon <laughs> it's got a little bit left in it so yeah um so i thought well that won't do you know that's not that's not very iot friendly way of telling how much beer you've got <laughs> so um so i actually built um i've got three kegs in the fridge so i actually built a little load cell based on a sort of a little aluminium plate yeah. that sits under each of the kegs. And so what it does, it knows the tear weight of the keg when it's empty. So when I get a keg refilled and bring it back, I just put it on that that scale in, in the fridge and it sits in there permanently and that weighs the keg once a minute. Oh, wow. So I always know exactly how much beer I've got in the keg. And because it's real time as well, it also shows your, your consumption as you're drawing down, you know, pulling a, um, pulling a pint or two from each of the kegs as you go so so yeah that was that was a pretty fun project also integrated that with google home as well yeah. google assistant so i can actually ask google hey google has my beer <laughs> and i'll get a, a reading of how many pints are left in each of the kegs and also the the temperature that the beer's at as well so you know that's a pretty good little party trick to show people when they're um when they come around this is awesome um so you've got so on the, i want to just delve a little bit deeper into that, you mm. know, the weight sensor in the fridge. So how is that powered? Like, because obviously, you know, being a fridge, it might be a, a moisture sort of area. You don't have power cords running into the fridge or anything. Is it battery based? 
Yeah, so what I've got is a um, the, each of the load cells comes back to out of the fridge via a, like a flat mm-hmm. ribbon cable and the ESP8266 that, that powers it all is actually based outside nice. the fridge because, yeah, you're right, yeah. Phil, if that was, if that was in the fridge, it'd yeah. start to get moisture on it. It probably wouldn't, wouldn't last yep. very long. So that lives outside the fridge, which also, um, you know, the Wi-Fi coverage in the fridge probably isn't too of fantastic course, yeah. either. So it helps having that outside of the fridge. So, yes, yeah, so it's just got a ribbon cable that goes to each of the three load cells and also the temperature sensor uh, within the fridge as well. And then that just communicates via the Wi-Fi back to Home Assistant. So, yeah, it works, works pretty well. Yeah, because I know um, when I was automating my shopping list with Grocy, they support things like weighting of items, right? To mm. work out how much, you know, instead of, you know, you've got litres of milk, right? And you put the milk on a scale, you could tell, you know, how much milk you have in stock, right? Mm-hmm. And I was always wondering, like, you know, what is the, I saw because, you know, I'm not very, I don't want to solder anything. You know, I, I never used ESP32 for quite some time. And I was like, you know, how does one get like a weight sensor? So I Googled my, you know, what's the best weight sensor? You know, there's got to be like a product on the market that does it. Nothing, there's nothing really out there that does it. But it sounds like, you know, this little mm. thing that you've created mm. here would be like the ideal place, right? Like the, give it, get that weight, push it up through an API to Grossy, and then Grossy can say, hey, this is how much um, it's weighing mm. at the moment. This is how much you've got in stock refill it sort of thing because I'm, I'm thinking things in the cupboard like sugar salt you know all those things that have a weight that as you're consuming them go down would be a great use case mm-hmm. yeah exactly and i guess that's the advantage of so having that background in doing the, the hardware and the software is that you can do a lot of bespoke sensors and applications that you just can't buy stuff for i mean you, you, mm. it's just there's nothing that that's on the market that does that so so you can you know do those sort of use cases that that aren't really covered yeah cool i'll have to look into these what, what are they called like it's for the weight like is it a- yeah so you get a um so it's actually like a load cell um is and it's it's basically like a little resistive pad that's glued to a yeah. sort of it looks like a solid metal bar yep. but it deflects very slightly when you put weight on right. it the resistance changes and then it just goes through a like a very sensitive amplifier that amplifies the voltage change yeah. or the resistance change um, as the as the little metal bar bends when it gets weight on it, and then that produces an output that that you can read on the ESP. Beautiful. Yeah, H H X seven eleven. Yeah, I think there's been a few people on the show that have talked about them. I think one of your previous guests is talking about doing bed weighing and stuff, mm. and they hadn't got them to work. And yeah, it did did take a bit of tweaking, but they definitely work once you get them going. <laughs> yeah, it's probably me saying. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's and that, and that's the thing. I think I think I found that it was. I I, I mean I kind of stopped working on it just because I got distracted. But uh, but it, it's 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 exactly it, right. It was it was it, it wasn't the easiest to set up. I will say, um, just to get it to to read properly and things like that. And then and then maybe it was just my soldering skills are just that poor. I don't know. But <laughs> it was. There is a lot of mucking around with the calibration on them because you've got to both work out the zero tear point of it yeah. and also what the delta is as the load changes on it. So they don't come calibrated. You've kind of got to put like one kilo weights on it and see like how much it changes for a mm. one kilo weight and then kind of work back from there. So, and each mm-hmm. one is different. So you can't just sort of go, okay, well, I've bought one. Now I can apply these same calculations to the all of them, you've basically got to individually calibrate each of them. And I think that's probably where a lot of people come unstuck is that if you don't realise you've got to go through that calibration process, you just get nonsensical readings from them. So that probably puts a lot of people off using those. So, Do you find that you have to recalibrate them? Uh, no, never. That's good. No, I did, um, I did calibrate them outside the fridge and then I realised that the readings change on them when they're cold inside the fridge. So I did, yeah. I did have to do one one recalibration after I did the initial put them in the fridge. But um, after that, they've been they've been rock solid and it's accurate to within, I guess, probably about half a pint. Um, so you know you don't you don't um, get too much variability across the the whole range of keg from full to empty. That's awesome. Yeah, that's also a good uh, unit of measure of. Uh... How many pints you have left, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's the most That's practical. Right. It's the most practical, practical unit of measure you can have for a keg, right? That's funny. 
Cool. And I, was, I played with ultrasonic sensors a fair bit as well. So, so one of the things that I did was, you know, like, like everyone, I made a remote control for the garage out of the ESP 8266 with a relay, which is, you know, one of the sort of most common projects yeah. that you see people do. But I also put a couple of ultrasonic sensors on it. So I used one that detects whether the garage, mm-hmm. so it's one of those tilt type garage doors. So, so I basically got one sort of near the front of the garage and one in the middle of the garage. And the one at the front of the garage detects whether the door's up or down. So that gives me the sort of open, Mm -hmm. closed state of the door. But the one in the middle of the garage actually points to the roof of the car. So not only does it give you the door state, it'll actually tell you whether the car is in the garage or not. Because basically it measures it and it goes, well, if it's less than a metre, it's reflecting off the roof of the car and and therefore the car is in the garage. That's actually what I use for driving a lot of my presence Mm. and the state of the home as well. So... Um, so I basically got a, you know, my, my presence, well, I've got a, an input select to basically whether you're home, whether everyone's home or not, that's based on once the car goes out of the garage, it then checks the presence of everyone's phones. If the phones are then not home, then it puts the house into an away state because I just found that using the, you know, the ping type uh, person detection was just a a bit flaky mm-hmm. with with iPhones because I think they turn the Wi-Fi sort of on and off. Yeah, the Wi-Fi goes to sleep and all that sort of yeah. Yeah, so I tried to use that for presence detection and it just wasn't it wasn't very reliable. So now I'm yeah. kind of using a combination of whether the car is in the garage or not and the geolocation on the phone and that's been yeah. like that's been rock solid. So I really um I really like using the app geolocation for that um, presence stuff. Have you gone to the level of being able to tell which car's parked in which part of the garage in case someone's parking in your spot? Um, yeah, we've actually got two cars and um, it actually knows the difference. One's a little bit shorter than the other one. So, yes, I can actually tell which car's oh, in the cool. garage that's based awesome. on the height of the roof. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's a pretty that's a pretty handy thing to have as well. Yeah, that's that's neat. So, so the ultrasonic, I guess, gives you, because that makes sense, right? Because it gives you the distance to the... Or you know the distance of car A versus car B. Yeah, yeah. And it's pretty, I mean, yeah. it's pretty um, a coarse type of measurement. So basically it goes, sure. well, if it's greater than about 1.5 metres, then there's no car in because it's measuring to the floor on the garage. If yeah. it's, you know, between sort of 1.5 and like 1.2 or something, something like that, then it's the it's the little car. And if it's less than one, then it's the big car. So that's how it kind right. of works out the distance. So. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's cool. What are you doing? Anything else for presence, or just those two? Just the phones and uh, and uh, no, just sensor. just those. I've I've I have played around with um, Bluetooth a little bit to see if I could sort of use that. But but yeah, I think it didn't really kind of work the way that I was that I was wanting it to. So I pretty much right. stuck with the with the geolocation and the car status. That was as, as good as it's going to get. I thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but what happens if you park it outside or something like that? Does that uh, obviously that breaks that part but does your uh do you still act as home yeah well if it detects um yeah so with the with the coming back to home any of the um any of the presence detections will turn the house back into the home state so if right. the car comes in or it detects someone's phone or um or you come back into the geolocation area it'll it'll know that you're um, back in because quite often you know we'll go out and then if we go somewhere close by i might decide to walk home or something like that so yeah, yeah so it's it's a combination of those that i use to determine um coming back home and because it's an input select as well if it's you know if you get it wrong you can just go in manually and say i'm home or turn it back to home and and it'll um put the house back into home state rather than away state right right have you found any issues where like if you're driving home that your presence will change to home before you get there because of that geolocation um not uh yeah sometimes like but within like 50 meters of home or something like that so it's not yep. you know that i'll be halfway across the suburb and i'll do it or anything like that so it's usually i think i've got my sort of home radius set to i don't know 50 meters or something like that so yeah. so yeah it's it's not too bad it's it's done it once or once or twice but it's pretty reliable okay that's good yeah you you mentioned you have uh you have kids are you doing anything for presence on on that side or no, I've just got the like the ping sensors on their phones, but again, like you know, they're not that reliable. So I mean, they're still in their early teens, so we're mostly home when they're home. Right. Okay. 
Makes sense. And what do you got around the house or how can other people interact with the house? Are you using any voice assistants around the home? Yeah, I, I did start off using um, the Google Assistant platforms quite a bit, but uh, mm. I just like it. <laughs> I just found I just it just caused more problems. You know, the, the family acceptance factor on the on the Googles wasn't great because yeah. a lot of the time, you know, sh- she wouldn't understand what I said or um, or the TV. Classic Australian yes, problem, right? Yes, like, exactly. Just, you've got to have an American accent to be able to talk to those yeah. things. Even if you've got the language set to Australian English, you've got to fake an American accent Correct. to do what you want it to do. Yeah, and especially when you're doing, because um, I was doing routines that were the doing mm. stuff in Home Assistant as well and, you know, yep. That's not available right now. So anyway, so I've sort of got a bit tired of those, and and then I went to the Google Nest hubs, um, you know, the yep. little the little screens, yep. and they were really really great until Google released a software update for them and broke the best function that they had. So you used to be able to cast to them using the inbuilt cast on Home Assistant, but Google released a software update, and now after ten minutes they go back to displaying the clock screen. Mm. So um, right. yeah, so that was that was. The, uh, that was the end of Google um, Google Nest Hubs for a, a cool interface platform. So I just ended up buying some cheapy Android tablets and now I'm kind of using them as most of the around the house interfacing type devices. The other thing I've done just in the last few months is I, I hadn't really got into the Zigbee stuff before. I kind of thought, oh, I've got my Wi-Fi, you know, that's all, that's all I need. But there was a few things where I'm like, ah, oh, that's going to be really hard to battery power that or it's you know it's not going to work that way so i started getting into the zigbee stuff and i I hit the jackpot there because just about the time when i started to look into that you know jb hi-fi phil um Mm -hmm. they were getting rid of all their samsung smart things um sensors yeah of course. so <laughs> i can't believe one i can't believe samsung smart things took so long to get out to australia and then when it did it was they did like some commercial arrangement that like made it non viable yeah. to come out here anyway um i think they did like an exclusive deal with you know all the motoring companies or something to do like a, a smart home sort of kit and so you had to if you wanted to buy it Originally, when you wanted to be the first one to get a Samsung Smart Things, you had to be like either with you know your local motoring mm. auto club or something um, to get their special deal. Interesting. And then they sort of then they slowly released out mm. to all the retailers like Best Buy or JB Hi-Fi that we've got down here. Yeah. And I think by then, you know, everything had moved on, right? Yeah, but the great thing was they they basically sold them all for fire sale price. So the right. leak detectors and the the multi-purpose sensors, I basically picked up like a dozen of each of those for 10 bucks each that's, when they're normally oh, like 30 35 yeah. or 40 bucks so yeah. yeah so i got a um i got a combi at the same time and set up decons on that mm-hmm. so i just went crazy with those sensors like i put the leak detectors under pretty much every bathroom every sink yeah. the yep. dishwasher the you know everything that has water in it got a got a leak detector and most of the the windows and doors got a got a multi-purpose sensor on them so yeah, right, right place, right time for that. But that's the long way of answering that. I also got the the buttons. I started getting a couple of the Zigbee buttons yep. as well. And believe it or not, they're actually my kind of go-to interface um, now for switching things on and off. Just because they they just like they work, they're reliable. Everyone understands how to press a button, mm-hmm. right? So yeah, so for for a lot of the simple kind of automations and the the lights and the doors and those sorts of things, I've I've been moving a lot of that stuff off the tablet interfaces to just those buttons. So I've kind of got one, you know, beside the bed that I use for turning various lights on and off, and one in the garage for different bits and pieces. And yeah, I've been getting the Xiaomi ones because they've actually got six different modes that you can. So you've got one press, two press, all the way up to five presses, and a long press as well. So they can actually do six different things. Which Xiaomi one? Ones though, like, are they wired in or are they the battery ones? No, no, no. It's the Xiaomi. It's the Mi. And it's like a. It's just a little coin cell. Yeah. So I've got a whole bunch of those. So I've got like the single um, one and the double because you can get the single press buttons and the double press like yeah. two sides for them. I've only ever been able to get like the single press to work on them. Maybe I've got an old version of the firmware running on them or something. I've got an old version of the Switch, but I'll have to look into it. Yeah, well, I tried 
I tried a few different ones. I tried some of the the earlier Aquara ones, yeah. and also had I had one of the Smart Things ones as well, which is okay. But um, but yeah, these um, these Xiaomi ones that I've got now, so they've got the six mm. the six functions on them. So it's just one button, but like if you press it, depending on the number of times you press it, that's what it picks up on. So so yeah, you know, one press might be to turn these lights off, and two press might be to do those, and three might be to you know open the door or something like that. Yeah, so that's cool. yeah. And they're like, they're rock solid. Um, they're very responsive too. Like, yeah, yeah. And when you're using them with your, you know, MQTT out of Home Assistant, it's just it's instantaneous. There's like no lag yep. between when you yeah. press the button and when things happen. So, yeah. So just for a simplicity point of view, I've been moving a lot of those sort of interfacing back to those um, buttons just because they work and they're a great great interface and everyone understands them so. yeah no that's awesome how do you handle the sort of like the user interface in terms of instructions for people so like do you have have you put like stickers or icons on the switches or something so people know like this button's going to turn on a light this button's going to open a door or i have to tap it three times to do this have you thought of that at all yeah, for the for the ones that I use, that's fine. For the others, exactly. I have to put a little a little laminated card below them to yeah. exp- explain to other people in the household what what they do mm-hmm. um, most of the time. So, yeah. But at least, you know, so someone knows that they're gonna if they flick that button, it's gonna turn the laundry light off and you know, yeah, not accidentally turn on the fireplace and burn everything down, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's right. And the one, the one in the garage, it's got a. I've, I've done a little Google Home announcement. Whereas, if you press the one in the garage, it because we've got a two-story house and the garage is downstairs, and the and the kids will never voluntarily come and help you get stuff out of the car. So, <laughs> when you push the one in the garage, Google says someone needs help in the garage, and sometimes the kids come and help you. So oh, that's funny. I'm I'm surprised it works. Regardless, maybe you need to change it to that. Um... Oh, if someone's fallen over in the garage and they need help, quick, yeah. right? Yeah, or maybe you know, there's a treat for you in the garage or something <laughs> yeah. like that. That'd probably that'd probably get them down. I was there. gonna say that that's probably the one that'll get them rather than someone's fallen or someone needs help. Just <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, what what are some like really cool overall, like just really cool automations you've done? Um, yeah, so uh, a few years ago, I got solar installed mm. and the inverter that I got has got a few features that kind of help out with, with home assistance. So it's got a it's got a consumption meter as well as a production mm. meter. So normally with your solar, it'll tell you how much you're producing, but not how much your, your whole house is consuming. So um, I got one with a, a consumption meter as well, and also a a load switching relay. So and it's also got Wi-Fi and a good API as well. So Home Assistant actually has the Fronius integration um, out of the box as well. So so what I've done is I pull the the current production and consumption of the solar into Home Assistant. And then use that to drive a few sort of energy saving automations. Right. So like the hot water, it heats up during the day. So I've just got a normal like electric solar uh, storage hot water. Mm-hmm. So what happens is that that heats up during the day when the solar is producing, but then it then doesn't heat again sort of overnight. But what that means is that, you know, if you're the first person in the morning, you'll likely get a, get a cold shower out of it. Mm. So what I've done is... At four o'clock in the morning, I check the the temperature from my outside weather station and then do a boost of the hot water just enough so that you get a you get a hot shower. So obviously in summer where it's you know easily over twenty degrees in the morning mm-hmm. here, it boosts it back up to fifty degrees. But in winter, it boosts it back up to 56 degrees because, you know, that's a 50 degree shower in winter doesn't feel like a hot shower, whereas a 50 degree shower in summer feels like a hot shower. So, yeah, so I'm kind of using that just enough electricity to heat it back up again so you get a hot shower in the morning. And I was I was listening to the podcast from last week and the new, um, what's the one where you can use, um, it's the... Hang on, I'm just trying to remember what it's called. Oh, the referencing other entities in the triggers. Yes. Yeah, because at the moment I've kind of got that hot water one and I've also got an air conditioner one similar where the air conditioner will run depending on whether you're exporting solar or not. So they're this kind of kludgy automation at the moment that isn't great and it uses um, input selects as well. So it works, but it's not fantastic. Right. But 
with that um, with that referencing other entities in triggers, that's going to clean up a whole bunch of stuff mm. and and make those automations a whole lot cleaner. So, yeah, so I need to get onto 2021.7 soon so I can use that because that will be something that will tidy up a whole bunch of those unpleasant automations that I've got. I mean, they work, but they're not pretty, right? Yeah, like, <laughs> it, it's just, it's kludgy, right? It's, it's a little messy in how you build them. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and all up, like I worked it out with the automations that I'm running now, as opposed to, you know, before I was just turning stuff on when I felt like it and turning it off when I felt like it, probably saving about about four or 500 bucks a year um, awesome. in electricity. Yeah. So, you know, so it's a good, yeah, it's a good, um, good return on investment on my, my time and effort to, um, yeah. to figure out how to do these things. So, and to get the API from your solar system, was that something that you specifically did research on and said, you know, from when you're looking to install your solar, I said, yes, I want this sort of system set up or was it something that was just no. a standard that you were surprised that came with it? Yeah, well, I was probably just lucky because the inverter that I got, I knew it had a, look, it had a Wi-Fi interface. Mm-hmm. So that was that was kind of my level of knowledge of that at the time mm. because I got that before I got home assistance. Yep. So, so yeah, it, it was just lucky that I managed to get one that actually had a, like an open API, which I could have, could have queried with just any old piece of software, but also that it had an integration already with home assistance. So that was, um, that was pretty lucky because if that hadn't been the case, then I wouldn't have had that flexibility yeah. and been able to do a lot of those, um, a lot of those things. So yeah, so that's been, that's been good. And I retro I retrofitted the air conditioner as well because it's just a standard um, a dumb air conditioner mm. with an infrared remote. Mm-hmm. Because I because back in my Arduino days I had all my infrared libraries. I basically just set up a learning infrared remote, pointed the aircon <laughs> remote at it, and kind of just recorded all the codes for yeah. you know on off cool dry fan temperature up temperature yeah. down then just built a um built an infrared transmitter that sits on the wall opposite the air conditioner and just you know fires infrared code to the air conditioner so, so yeah that was that was a good way to turn a dumb air conditioner smart for for not a lot of money so. yeah no that's awesome and then you can even get things like the the sensibo and i think there's in the z wave world there's you know proper yeah. um, z wave infrared controller for air conditioners as well right so you can bring them in as proper entities as well, instead of just having to fire off dumb infrared commands at things too yeah yeah well it's got um it's got a i put a temperature sensor in that as well so it actually you know so it measures the mm-hmm. temperature of the lounge room where the air conditioner right. is and also got um for the power monitoring just for the appliances i'm just using you know the standard sort of power monitoring plugs but for those high power appliances like the hot water and yeah. the, and the aircon, I've actually got the split core current measuring devices on them, and they go back to an ESP that's running the uh, EMON package on those. So that's how that information gets into Home Assistant. So both the whole house consumption I get from the inverter, but also individual devices and appliances I get from from plugs or those mm-hmm. or those current transformers on those as well. So got a good picture of what's you know what's actually mm-hmm. on and what's using power and and um, and what's going where. So what do you have like a list of devices that you're trying to track power against? Like if you've got like the main appliances like fridge, freezer, and all that tracked, or, or then the TV, I'm guessing. Uh, yeah, most of the, I guess the fridges um, also have the, the washing machine as well, just for the notifications yep. when it's done. So I've just got the, you know, measure the power, measure the power consumption of that. Obviously, the big consumers of the power are the air conditioning and the hot water. So, you know, I like to know when they're on as well, just to make sure that they're on at the right time and I'm not not spending money where I don't need to. Yeah. And those are just uh, those passive uh, clamp style ones that you use, right, to pull the power? Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And they interface easily with, again, with the ESP8266. So I just use those, yeah. With the ESPs, I've, as I said, all my code on there is stuff that I've written, but I was, yeah, I was listening to Phil talking last um, last podcast about his ESP home experience there. Mm -hmm. So I haven't gone down that path yet, but it does sound like it's pretty, um, it's pretty interesting. So I might give that a go. I'll add it to the list. (laughs) Exactly right. You have a growing list. Yeah. Yes. No. Yeah. yeah. ESP Home is. Uh, I don't know. I. I think. I think it's great personally for someone that doesn't. You know, that's not super coding literate, if you want to call it right, or programming literate. Like in that mm. sense, it just makes things easy, right? And just interfacing into even things like Home Assistant, things like that. It just 
kind of just does it. So it's really nice. Yeah, and sometimes I want that. You know, sometimes I do want to write sure. code and and have the different sensors and whatever. And I I know that that's something that's yeah. that I've got to write the code for. But sometimes I just want something simple. I'm like, yeah, maybe I yeah. can just put ESP Home on it and it's done, and I'd have to worry about all that other stuff. Yeah, exactly. And ESP Home is all YAML based anyway, so you've already done yeah. the hard work learning YAML to begin with. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you um have you guys done anything with the um 3D floor plans at all? I attempted quite some time ago. I think I actually had it pretty nicely at one point, but I guess I so I'm using like Fire Amazon Fire tablets around the house. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I just find that they don't have enough, especially with Lovelace, you know, Lovelace is now becoming uh, it's more modern than what the old Amazon Fire tablets I've got mm. uh, are capable of running. Really, looking at my, I've got fully kiosk running on those things, so it's you know like mm-hmm. a nice kiosk experience. But for whatever reason, now that's crashing. I just found that the tablets were too slow to do things, and also it was very hard, you know, to yes, I'd have this nice looking, awesome three D plan, and then you would have this like little icon from home assistant to where a light would be and you wouldn't see it necessarily easily like right and then i was like ah, oh, that it looks it doesn't like for me it was just like nah it's not a good user experience yes it's cool like as to as a show off factor but i didn't <laughs> want to yeah. i didn't have enough um time and will to want to put heaps of design into it which yeah. i didn't think was going to be able to use by me right oh yeah it's a it's a if you want to go down that rabbit hole yeah you'll 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 burn tens if not hundreds oh, of yeah, hours yeah. doing that so yeah i i played around with it for a while I, I actually got it yeah similar i think phil where it's pretty pretty happy but if you want to then kind of make it that perfect experience yeah. like oh, i would have easily sunk another hundred hours in it to to make it beautiful but mm-hmm. like even some of the ones online i've seen people wear like you know you tap a room when the light is on and then it'll have like a dark state and then a light state for when the light's on like that stuff is cool and i understand like the appeal to that but for me the amount of effort to get to that level i just i couldn't justify it right yeah well that's what i did i did a few rooms with uh with that tap for lights um and also did the with the car presence in the garage as well Mm. also did the room indicator for the garage actually shows you a car in the garage when the car's in the garage and the garage empty when the car's out of the garage so i think i saw someone actually animate their car driving in and out of the garage (laughs) yeah yeah there's there's a couple (laughs) yeah no i didn't i didn't go that far again that's that's probably 100 hours you'd burn you'd burn to do that easy yeah 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 it's it's uh, again i i think i think that's my hesitation too right it's like if you want if you want to do it and and don't get me wrong there are some that are very 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 Mm. nicely done Right. But it's just it's the amount of effort that goes into that for and 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 I think, Phil, you're kind of the same way as well. And like, I don't I don't primarily use the Home Assistant interface to drive Home mm-hmm. Assistant. Right. I primarily use what's all automations and then voice to kind of augment a lot of that. But I think that's the thing. I, like, I think I think it'd still be pretty cool to have just like a status like when you walk in the house or whatever, just a little tablet that shows, you know, what what's what's happening at home. Right. So. I think that's where I'm sort of like starting to head towards too, especially since like starting to use like um, the soft UI approach, you know, nice big button cards that, you know, have, you know, meaning behind them. So I'm sort of, Mm -hmm. if I ever, you know, in my next house, I'm going to, you know, try and get like a a proper tablet that has more RAM behind it that can actually run Lovelace properly and maybe a bigger screen and just have like, you know, Lovelace as the home's dashboard, right? And just have widgets, basically like an iOS notification shade, right? You know, the dishwasher's dirty, go ahead. You know, the washing machine's done. There's mail in the mailbox. You know, just status updates that people can see. And then maybe some modes, you know, like toggle, you know, movie mode on or off or toggle guest mode on or off, you know, just big buttons, you know, not not any of this Lovelace uh, or even just old, you know, entity switches and all that, like Mm. anything that... We would, as an admin, I would need to use it, yes, if I need to go in and see a state or something. But I think anything else could just be a little notification that can be read from afar, basically, and just. Yeah. yeah. One of the things I did do with the with the 3D plan, which was good, was that we've got like there's a lot of doors around the house. We've got probably probably six six or eight sort of doors to get in and out of the house and just because we've got upstairs deck and downstairs and garage and mm. front door and side door and all that sort of stuff so right. um so i made the 
um, the floor plans so that if any doors were open, um, they turn red on the floor plan. So oh, yeah. it is, it's actually a good little indicator to just, you know, do a quick visual check of it and just say, okay, well, yep. nothing's red. So therefore all the doors are closed and we don't have to, you know, we haven't accidentally left anything open. So that's... Yeah. yeah so that would be like a cool thing for a central sort of, yeah. you know, tablet in the, in the kitchen or something, right? And you can just quickly glance over at it. Yeah, rather than sort of scrolling through a list yeah. of entities and going, oh, yeah, open, yeah, it's, yep. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's pretty neat. But, yeah, it's, uh, same same sort of thing as you feel. You get to a state and you go, oh, yeah, it's good. If I wanted to make it fantastic, it would be <laughs> lots of extra <laughs> yeah. time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You need, like, a team of people behind you to get everything perfect. That's right. right. Yeah. Oh, and it's like it's it's that sort of image manipulation, so it's like, it's a couple of pixels here and a oh, hang on. Yep. No, is it 87% or 87.2%? And, yes. and if you've got two tablets with different screen sizes yeah. and it doesn't scale correctly, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So my it's um it's perfect. I have to I've actually got two two of them. I've got one for the desktop where all the icons are perfectly aligned and I've got another version for the mobile app. Uh, mm -hmm. because the the overlay icons are slightly different. So right. because I've actually overlaid my surveillance cameras onto it as well, so I can just like uh, look at the plan and if I want to see a camera, I've got a camera icon oh, on nice. all the cameras. So, you know, that works well, but they are sort of all, they're misaligned if you use the desktop one on the mobile and vice versa. So I've got to do a different different one with different spacing and positioning. So, um, so yeah, it does take a bit of work to get it get it nice. That's cool. What solution did you go with for your cameras? Um, I actually bought, <laughs> believe it or not, I actually bought the super cheapy eBay China cams just because I know how to firewall them off and yep. Yep. I know how to talk to them via either the interface or curl or, mm -hmm. you know, I can, I can do that stuff with them. I would probably never recommend buying those for anyone who didn't have that level of capability yeah, because they're, yeah. you know, they're not consumer friendly by any stretch. The interfaces on them are pretty terribly written. Probably terribly translated as well. Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. But, um, you know, if, you, if you're good with curl and you can uh, use that to do a lot of the interfacing, as long as they've got RTSP mm. and yeah. OnVIF, um, that, that's really all you need from them because they can do everything like that. The only exception is where I specifically wanted like a PoE um, camera. Yeah. So yeah. most of them are Wi-Fi, but I had a couple of PoE. So I actually bought a, I bought a Rio Link for that one. One, so a name brand mm -hmm. one and I've just actually put a video doorbell in as well so I got a, a high vision for the video doorbell yep. um, because again it's actually got an API on the doorbell so the neat thing is one of the endpoints API endpoints tells you whether doorbell is idle or ringing so what I do uh. is I poll that endpoint once a second just using the rest sensor from home assistant yep. right. and that's my doorbell so Damn, they can't do a webhook because <laughs> I'm having to poll yeah. for that seems yeah. mighty frustrating. Yeah. Right? Although it's I mean it's it's hardwired, right? It's PoE mm. and it's um Is it local or does it go up to a cloud? Though? No, it's all that was local. So I had a had a pretty oh, okay, pretty um strict set of criteria when I was looking for this doorbell. So I wanted it to be PoE, I wanted it to be local, yeah. I wanted it to be RTSP, and I wanted mm. it to work with Home Assistant. So, you know, that narrows the list. Oh, and it's got to be, it's got to work in Australia. So that narrows your list down to about two. Sure. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so I got got this hike vision and it's been really good. So, yeah, the polling is a bit of a pain, but again, it's been rock solid. Basically, you press the button on the doorbell and, you know, Google Lady tells you there's someone at the door. Also get the, you know, the pop-up via the iOS app on my phone mm -hmm. as well. So I'm using the automation of that to do a notification to the phone as well. So, yeah, it's it's pretty handy having that in Home Assistant because I haven't got anything else triggered particularly off it yet. But, you know, if I wanted to, I could tie that into um, pretty much anything else around the house that I wanted. So. Sure. That's cool. That might have to be my replacement for the ring video cam i've got because i've got like the battery ring video cam and th the delay in you know i can hear someone's press the doorbell yeah. right and it's ringing outside before the little lady of the amazon echoes has told me that there's someone at the front door 
and I've got the Echo shows around the house for her to show who's at the front door. Mm. But it's I'm sitting there waiting, you know, a few, you know, 30 seconds for the video to pop up on those things. By the time then, the delivery man's gone and assumed I'm not home, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I think being local-based and not having to rely on the cloud and all that would be much better. I think I think the problem is battery too, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I've read like all those reviews of the rings and you know all those the the Ufis and all those other ones and yeah. um and I like I spent probably far too much over analyzing it. But yeah, I ended up getting with that local control and and the RTSP is Blue Iris for my um, yeah. mm. video recording solution. So it had to integrate with Blue Iris. So it's been pretty good. There's all sorts of other stuff you can do with the API as well, but I haven't kind of um, spent the time on that i had a had a bit of a play with deep stack as well to try and get the person recognition on it and yep. yeah i, yep. I kind of got that working but not quite so that's on the list as well you're just you're just opening this up for phil to grill me around it's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah rohan's already built his deep stack stuff to do delivery people he can just get that's you the right code. that's right i i wish i wish yeah. i wish though though <laughs> i gotta say i did i think i don't know if i mentioned this on the show but i got it uh, i was telling phil offline but uh I, I was playing around with uh, OpenCV uh, just for some stuff I was doing for work for a customer. And it's actually pretty cool. You can you can do a bunch of interesting things, right? So I was manipulating video to like blur faces dynamically as it detects a face and like doing that kind of stuff. It's it's actually pretty neat. Yeah, I think it's got it's got heaps of potential. I just, yeah. I thought, uh, you know, I'll set it up quickly and it'll work and it'll be great. Yeah, and it yeah. didn't. So I thought I'll <laughs> I'll add it to the list. I haven't actually done that much with lights and light switches. I've only got sort of a handful of those, I guess, because I kind of came at it from mm-hmm. the, the opposite direction to a lot of people who probably start off with the lights and, you know, switches. I've just got a couple of the, the sort of Wi-Fi switches. What's your plan of attack for lights? So you're going to go switches, going to go smart bulbs or... Yeah, I think, I think I'm going to go with the switches. Um... Uh, yeah, because I yeah I think so. Um, because the thing about the switches, I guess, it's good is that you can always override mm. that if someone turns the switch off accidentally. Whereas right. if it's just a smart bulb, you can't you can't necessarily override um, that. Yep. So I kind of yep. like the switch idea. When I do a few more of them, I may have a different view of it. But that's kind of what I'm thinking. If you go Zigbee switches, they'll um because they're powered, they'll increase your mesh network too. Yeah, I've just at the moment I've just got the house is pretty good. It's just like a timber frame, so my Zigbee stuff works mostly except the sort of extremes. So I just got one of those repeater plugs mm-hmm. that's on a power board kind of in the middle of the house because the combi's downstairs. Yep. So I've just got one of those repeater plugs for upstairs which works pretty well, but um, I do need to extend it because in some of the corners of the house, like they'll drop off sort of once a week or something like that. Um, Always in the most inconvenient time. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've actually got one in the fridge. I put one of the temperature sensors actually inside the fridge upstairs. I just stuck it to one of the shelves in the fridge and that's got an automation on it because, you know, the kids sometimes just leave the fridge door just that tiny Mm -hmm. bit ajar. Mm -hmm. And, you know, living up here in Brisbane in summer, you come back to it after it's been open for half an hour and everything in there is saturated because it's so humid. So, um, yeah, so I put one of those little Zigbee temperature sensors in the fridge and I've just got an automation that runs on that when it gets over 10 degrees for more than five minutes. um, It tells you the fridge door is left open, so you go and close the fridge door and it's all... It's all good. That one's a bit flaky, I think, because it's kind of far away from the repeater and the the combi, and it's also inside, inside a metal box yeah. Yeah. as well. So that doesn't help. But yeah, yeah so if I think you've, I, that's a good idea, Phil. So if I went with that, I would have a lot more um, repeaters around the place. So I may actually go for those Zigbee switches rather than the rather than the traditional Wi-Fi. And there's actually some pretty nicely designed ones yeah. um, available in Australia now. Like generally. I've always been, you know, get Z-Wave, you know, for switches and, you know, anything yeah. critical. But there's a lot of good Zigbee stuff being available and, you know, alter code now as well. So, yeah, nice. Could even, I think it used to be um, like the, was it was Mirabella and you get the nice momentary buttons from them and then pair them against a Z-Wave socket behind it. But now I think you can get some really nice, like a full kit of just Zigbee stuff um, available in Australia. Yeah, cool. So, 
Yeah, I might have a look at that because my my Wi Fi is starting to get a bit a bit congested with all the um the stuff oh, that's yeah. on there, and especially the cat yeah, the cameras as yeah. well. Like they, you know, they chew a lot of that. So. Especially Wi Fi cameras. <laughs> yeah, so I might move some of that stuff to Zigbee. So that's that's probably a good idea. Put one of the Zigbee. Um, the multi-purpose sensors that I got because they do vibration as well. So, um, you know, mm -hmm. talk about yep. looking for a problem for a solution. So I put one of them inside the letterbox. And so when the, Perfect. yeah, when the postie um, um, puts them out of the letterbox, it wobbles slightly. And so the vibration sensor yeah. on that tells you've got, got mail. Especially now that they've cut the postie funding. So you get like deliveries of letters like every other day right you don't even know when you're gonna yeah. get a letter anymore so now you need to constantly oh interesting yeah yeah because they'll do like parcels every day but for letters which yeah you're hardly getting because you know everything's email right um yeah but for that one bank that doesn't support email yet because they're living in the stone age you know yeah. and you get that letter from the, the postie um you don't no. know when it's coming <laughs> so because i never check my letterbox unless yeah. the, notific the sensor goes off right yeah yeah so because that was inside the letterbox which is metal i had to pull that i had to pull that sensor apart mm. and um i actually put like an external wire antenna on as well so the antenna was outside the letterbox so interesting couldn't make the whole letterbox the antenna it, <laughs> no right. no <laughs> actually i uh, <laughs> didn't even think of that. I should have, should have, uh, should have thought of that. Funny. So, yeah. See, it's unfortunate. Yeah. We can't. Uh, we over here we have uh, community mailboxes, right? So they're basically these giant mm. metal mailboxes outside, yeah. wherever that are. Uh, it's just got like I don't know, like. 20 slots to one of them or whatever 20 25 slots to one of them and then there's like a in my case there's three of them sometimes i've seen like nine ten of them in a row right but it's so but it's all it's all like owned by canada post so you can't like drill through it or anything uh, right like yeah it's, okay you know, yeah it's but well, you can, but there's probably yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, right? you can do a lot of things. That doesn't make it a good idea, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How far away are they yeah. from your house, though? Like, if they're all community mailboxes. I'm actually lucky. Mine is directly opposite to my house. I've got uh, yep. I've got a fire hydrant and the post office there, so it's great for a insurance rates and b just convenience. But uh, <laughs> but uh, so it's directly. So is that is that like out in the street or is it? Uh... Yeah, yeah. In my in my case, it's on the opposite side of my street it's not too far like I, I think i could it'll probably be reaching the bounds of where my my if i was using zigbee as an example where my zigbee mesh would be mm. but um but it's also proper metal right so I don't, I don't actually think it'll penetrate through uh through that i wonder if you could like if you really wanted a sensor in that metal box you could probably do something like LoRaWAN, which is that like yeah wi-fi that can last like kilometers right mm. um surely that yeah but yeah it, because it's, it, um, i could but it's it's still in a giant metal box and the one I but i'm thinking like if it can do like kilometers of range though and you only need it to go you know like not very far from you the other side of the street you might be able to get a yeah it might work for that, yeah, yeah. I, I think you might be pushing it but yeah honestly i don't i don't care that much because nothing ever arrives and nowadays everything nothing important it's always a bill or a fine that you don't want to <laughs> yeah open exactly anyway, right? so why bother right so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's, oh taxes okay great like so. yeah all right cool all right. Well, Alan, thank you so much for your time yeah. and sharing all your interesting stuff. You've definitely yeah. given me some ideas, particularly around uh, weighing stuff in the fridge. I'm going to have to <laughs> do my research on that. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for yeah. thanks for having me. And, and yeah, thanks for running the podcast. I try and listen to it um, every uh, every couple of weeks when it comes out. And I always manage to learn something new or add something else to the list. So that's always good. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That's, that's right. right. It's Helping people spend money yeah. since... <laughs> <laughs> or helping people, helping people burn tens of hours since. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Going down many more rabbit holes trying to think how can they make more problems for themselves. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Well, thank All you very right. much. Cheers. All right, thanks, guys. Cheers. If you want to share your home assistant journey or come on as a guest, reach out to us at feedback at haspodcast.io. That's H-A-S-S -S podcast.io. The Home Assistant Podcast is hosted by Phil Hawthorne and myself, Rohan Karamandi. For links to topics we discussed today, check out our show notes on haspodcast.io.